now. Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Always glad to have you with us. And today we're going to be talking about one of Rhode Island's best known companies and one of its biggest employers. You know them as Citizens Bank and the green sign, but technically they are Citizens Financial Group. And we are joined today by the chairman and CEO of Citizens Financial Group, Bruce Van Zon. Bruce, you've been here before. Thanks for coming back. Yeah, my pleasure, Ted. So last time you were on, I was looking back at our last interview. It was late 2014, a little over two years ago. You were preparing, working on the spinoff from Royal Bank. Bank of Scotland, which had owned Citizens since the late 1980s. A lot has happened since then. So get us up to date. Where's the bank? Yeah, stay? Sure. Where do things so stand now? Actually, in late 14, uh, we took the company public, uh, largest commercial bank IPO in U.S. history. Uh, and then we had three sell downs in 2015, and we were completely uh, free and clear by the end of October from RBS. So people understand that means you s the bank slowly sold yeah, its RBS share. was selling its shares in Citizens and so there were four total transactions. The total amount distributed was about twelve and a half billion dollars worth of stock. So you're totally independent. Totally yeah. independent. And uh, yeah, it's been great to be independent. Uh, one of the nice things about uh, how we separated from RBS, we had a very uh, robust uh, capital account and so we've been using that, putting that to good work and growing loans adding new customers to the bank, investing uh, in future capabilities and technology. Uh, and uh, so far, I think our trajectory has been quite good. We've had uh, very strong top line revenue growth. Uh, we're executing our strategy well. Uh, the stock has uh, performed well. So, yeah, it's almost doubled just yeah, since July. I was looking this morning. At yeah, the we, we IPO'd at 21.50, and the stock's uh, trading above $36. So, uh, lots of great work from our colleagues. Uh, we're all on the same page. I think there's good spirit inside the company, so we're very pleased at our trajectory. Was it a relief when you finally, when you whatever last paperwork you signed with your friends in Scotland said, you know, you cheerio? Know, what was and we're interesting, on our own. Ted, is uh, I, I had been on the board and I had been CFO over there, and so I think the board. Uh, knew me pretty well and let me get on with it and uh, craft a plan and then go execute the plan. So uh, it kind of felt like we were operating, started to operate uh, since the IPO on our own. So it really was just the culmination of that whole effort. So I well recall as a part of my time political reporter, the nerves uh, among some Rhode Island leaders about as you went independent, would Citizens keep its its long-standing large presence in Rhode Island? You know, you're, you operate all over, especially throughout our region and yep. even beyond. Uh, but in the end, you made your decision to build a big new over 400,000 square foot corporate campus in Johnston. And you're actually with the governor just before this taping, right. uh, taking a look at, at progress there. Walk us through your thinking as you and the board. That's a big capital investment. I, I can't imagine you took the decision lightly on where to, to spend all that money and put all those people. Why did you end up going with Rhode Island? Well, I think uh, the, the Rhode Island was the easy part of that equation. So uh, we look at the quality of our uh, colleague base here in Rhode Island and uh, the great university system and uh, morphing to the to the needs of the future. We thought that uh, Rhode Island could continue to deliver uh, quality folks uh, that we would need as we play uh, offense going forward and uh, need to develop new capabilities. So uh, that was, you know, protecting that uh, base that we have uh, and having confidence about the future trajectory. That was number one. Then we had to think about, we had a big lease in Cranston that was coming due in 2018 and did we want to renew and work on that location or did we want to move to something that was uh, more uh, keeping with where we thought we wanted to take the company in terms of uh, just better space, uh, more collaborative space, uh, new technology uh, throughout the, the whole uh, facility, the whole campus. Uh, and we just thought it would be a real boost uh, overall to our colleague engagement, to how we can serve customers and develop good products for our customers. And the great news is we were able to do it at, I think probably at the end of the day, we'll save a little money relative to had we stayed where we were and had to put a fair amount of CapEx into that building. Even so, building yourself, you yeah, think you right, saving That's right, that's right. So I think, I think uh, it, it all came together that it was a great project at a reasonable cost and it's gonna be great for citizens. And it's also great for the state and great for the town of Johnston. And uh, it's interesting too, it was a little countercultural. to it seemed like it anyway, to go with a suburban, uh, new suburban corporate campus when we've seen all these headlines about you know GE famously is, is building uh, its new headquarters up in Boston and I know this isn't technically headquarters but yeah. why did you decide you still needed that big footprint sort of uh, the way we've seen a lot of companies well, I think our, our existing uh, colleague base here in Rhode Island is very comfortable with that pattern so they, they, they drive to work in their cars and uh, you know I think uh, enjoy 
uh, kind of those bigger floor plates. So some of the operations that we're putting out there uh, are, there's a big call center uh, with maybe 750 or 800 people. The total colleague count there is going to be about 3,000. Uh, there's also uh, big operations uh, groups and other corporate functions that tend to uh, enjoy being on the same floor so they can walk around and collaborate. So we're used to that uh, in terms of how we operate. If you tried to put us into a, a tall uh, city building uh, with many, many floors, it would be harder to accommodate that. So that was one of the things as we kind of thought through the alternatives. There were some attractive opportunities to come into the city, but I think at the end of the day, we're comfortable uh, in that campus setting. Can't imagine what tall building you might be thinking of as you answer <laughs> that question. So, uh, you already have, of course, a somewhat tall building, uh, downtown Providence, that's one right. citizen's uh, plaza there. What is the future of that building? Well, that, that's, that's still, not shutting down, No, right? that's still the corporate uh, headquarters, and uh, we have a nice boardroom there, and uh, we do have some uh, corporate staff functions there uh, uh, and groups. Uh, so we'll continue to stay there. Some of the talk in town signs is, well, Citizens says it's headquartered in Providence. Really, it's based in Boston or it's based in Stanford. Is there some truth to that, that m a lot of the, the big-time stuff at the bank has moved off well, to there? Well, you know, it, 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 we are a little bit diffused uh, because we cover 11 states, and so we have people located in some of those dif different states. But if you just look at the total colleague count, it's 5,300 in Rhode Island. It's about 3,300 in Massachusetts. Uh, it's uh, probably about 2,500 in Pennsylvania. So. Uh, just kind of look at the numbers. Uh, we have I have several of my Exco members based here in Providence. That's uh, the executive committee, right? Yes, sorry. <laughs> uh, and uh, and then we have uh, the folks who run the consumer bank and the commercial bank are ones ones kind of suburban Boston, ones in Boston. Uh, and so we have you know we have a key uh, person in the commercial bank based in Philadelphia. So we I think it's it's wise to actually uh, kind of be a little bit diffused um, and have presence in all those markets so we can have people attending events and making sure our community involvement is what it should be. Um, we the employment outlook at people wonder you know they, they I always say CVS or Citizen sneezes and you could get a lot of jobs or lose a lot of jobs because it's already such a big enterprise uh, for yeah. Rhode Island. You're a bit more than 5,000, I believe, said now in Rhode Island. What's the outlook uh, for that job footprint in Rhode Island? Do you expect it to rise, fall, stay about the same yeah, in the coming year? I think year, it probably years? stays about the same. We've seen uh, as we can uh, become more efficient and automate some jobs, uh, that frees up capacity to invest in the, in the new skills. Uh, and so, uh, for example, some of the operations uh, we can process uh, automate, which is effectively a, another word, ro robotics is, is, you know, you can very manual repetitive jobs, you can have smart computers do those jobs. The, the, if, we, if we have savings from that, uh, where's, the, where's the future? It's digital uh, banking, so investing in mobile and online applications. It's understanding more data about our customers, so-called big data mm -hmm. initiatives, so uh, we can offer online uh, ads for home equity loans and things like that. So I think you're getting, the demands are for more skilled uh, colleagues over time, and so there's kind of a washing uh, uh, effect of uh, some out and some in, but broadly stable. I'm up against a break, but I have to ask, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by that, uh, robotics and automation and what that will mean for jobs in the future. Do you, th do you think as someone look managing a large enterprise, is it mostly we're just going to slowly see the number of jobs drift down, or do you really think we're going to see just a shift you know, more jobs at different levels. I think it's a shift, and I think, and, and, and maybe you want to save this for after the break, but ultimately unemployment now in the country is quite low. Uh, you could end up with inflation if we, if we can't keep growing the labor pool. I think that's going to hit the wall at some point in the next two or three years. What's the antidote to that? You need more productivity since the service economy has become so big in the country. You've got to automate some of these jobs to boost productivity and then free up labor to be retrained to do some of these uh, you know, highly skilled jobs that we need going forward. Well, we're going to talk about a lot more about that, about the Rhode Island economy, about the future of your local bank branch and whether it'll still be open. So stay with us on Executive Suite. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and we are talking today with the man at the head of one of Rhode Island's best-known companies, one of its largest enterprises, Citizens Financial Group, which of course runs Citizens Bank, which probably has some branches in your own neighborhood. And I want to talk about branches, Bruce, because when people think of the bank, 
they think of they even think of their mortgage bill at the end of the month, and they think of a branch. They think of going downtown, especially yep. uh, as you get higher up in in age. Uh, and people always ask me if I say I have a bank exec on, what's going to happen with branches? Are we still going to have tellers, et cetera? Uh, and I know that's something you spend a lot of time in your team Absolutely. thinking about. Um, do you think we're going to get to where there'll be no branches or are branches changing? What's your thinking at the start of 2017 on the future of the bank branch? Yeah, I, I think uh, we will still have bank branches for a long, long time. Uh, I think they'll be different. So um, I think that's the, the trick is how do you transition from the old purpose for branches to what more the new purpose is going to be. Uh, so in the olden days, it was more focused on processing transactions. Mm -hmm. So you had many teller stations uh, and people came in, they waited on the teller line and uh, cashed their check or got their money out of their accounts, et cetera. We can do 95% of that with a smart machine mm -hmm. in, the, in the foyer. Uh, what we want to do is have people come in for advice and turn the branch effectively into advice centers. Uh, so what do we need? We, we, can, we can get rid of much of that teller uh, workspace uh, and we have to add more private uh, conference rooms and meeting rooms so that we can, somebody can schedule an appointment and come in and talk to us about what are their aspirations for their retirement or you know, are they putting kids through college and how do they save for that. Uh, so that's really where the, where the inflection point is now. We've just started on a process at Citizens Bank. Uh, we call it branch transformation is to take, we have 800 uh, standalone branches and 400 in-store branches mm -hmm. uh, and over a stop oh, uh, supermarkets, it's, yes, places right, like that. Supermarkets. So the, the, the plan is that over a 10 year period, we will convert all of those from the older formats into the newer formats. Uh, we've done about 40 so far. We have uh, two here in Rhode Island. One is in Woonsocket and one's in Cumberland Plaza. Uh, and so you can go check it out. But Are people uh, using it? Are they yes, open yes, to the, the, the new? The feedback's been very, very positive uh, because the decor is nice uh, and it's fit for purpose. And uh, we basically are upskilling the people in the branches so they know more about investments. They know more about the lending products. Uh, so it goes beyond just the basic uh, routine transactions. There was an interesting piece uh, Reuters had last year uh, about that some executives, some of your peers were finding they couldn't uh, close or shrink branches as fast as they wanted because even if the technology is there for customers to switch, they, they just don't want to necessarily. And I, yeah. I think of even myself, I still, the mobile check deposit just, I feel a little uncomfortable. Yeah. I do it, but then I'm like, right. I didn't hand it to a bank person or put it yeah. in an ATM. You know, how much is consumer well, I, I, psychology? Look, yeah, I think the adoption curve is quite strong, yeah. actually. So almost 50% of uh, those transactions are coming in through the automated channels uh, at this point. So so uh, that's been going up maybe 15% a year for the last uh, three years. Uh, and so I think, I think we'll continue to see that. Customers do need hand-holding, mm. uh, and so you need to show them the way. But uh, I think once they get the hang of it, it's just like if you go to take a flight, uh, you, you'd like to print out your own boarding pass and not wait on lines. And so I think the airlines have done a good job of training their customers and to do the self-check-in and things like that. And I think that's what we have to do in banking. I know my grandmother, very skeptical that anyone would give you money based on taking a picture of the check, that's yet right. I'm willing to do it. Do you, is it also, is it generational to some extent? That, yeah, you know, that, millennials more likely to true. say, that's fine. I think that's true. Yeah. I think, I think and, and, and so part of our strategy is uh, how do we engage those millennials? Uh, they don't actually like to come in and have the conversations if we're going to an advice-based model. Uh, one of the things that we just did is we uh, announced a partnership with a company called Sigfig uh, to uh, deliver wealth advice through the computer effectively. It's called Robo Advisory, uh, but uh, you can input your kind of where you are in life, what your objectives are, how much money you make, and it'll come up with a savings plan and an asset allocation plan. Uh, and if you don't, if you don't want to, you can still come in and talk to somebody in the branch. But uh, you can have interaction that way uh, with the bank. And I think a lot of millennials find that an attractive yeah, way to do. Trying business. to reach my antisocial generation. Yeah. That's right. um, more broadly, uh, what do you think are the biggest areas of focus for the bank this year, 2017, and looking ahead for growth? You've, you've talked about growth, growth, growth ever yeah. since you went independent. That's right. Well, I think our. Uh, uh, you know, commitment has been to grow the bank and grow the top line and put that capital to work and grow loans. 
I think we found really good opportunities to build up our commercial bank, and we've been growing that loan book now for at 8% plus for and that's loans three, to four years. Small, medium sized businesses, yeah, that sort that's of right, thing. That's right, that's um, right. And, uh, you know, part of that is actually at the bigger end. We were pretty big in the smaller end, mm. but in the bigger end, we hadn't really invested in the bankers and the product capabilities to go after slightly bigger companies. And so we've had a lot of gain in market share there as we've brought bankers onto our platform who have pre existing relationships. So that's been great. On the consumer side, we've uh, been building up our mortgage business, so we're originating more mortgage paper, which is good, uh, but also uh, we've really focused on the student lending market uh, because we see that there's too much student debt out there and it's at high interest rates and once somebody graduates college they have uh, a good credit rating and a good job and they should be paying less on those loans and so uh, we've uh, refinanced over 25,000 loans. The average size loan that we refinance is about $55,000, and the average savings to a borrower is between $150 and $175 a month. Wow. So that's a very socially useful product. It's, <laughs> very it's real addressing money a need it. in society, yeah. and it's real money to those people. And uh, it opens the door for us to get younger and to attract those folks as customers of the bank. So that's been a big area. Uh, we also uh, have some interesting new ways to d develop an unsecured lending business. It's hard to grow a credit card business, but uh, we have a partnership with Apple, for example. Uh, we're helping them uh, provide installment credit for people who purchase the iPhone under the iPhone up great program. Uh, there's a lot of reverse inquiry. A lot of other companies are now approaching us. Can we do something similar for them? So that's also been quite interesting for us. All right, we're going to take another break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the new regime in Washington and what it means for the economy and the banking sector with Bruce Van Zandt. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. We're talking today with Bruce Van Zon. He's the chairman and CEO of Citizens Financial Group, parent, of course, of Citizens Bank. And uh, big changes in Washington uh, in recent weeks. Uh, Donald Trump, of course, taking office with a Republican majority in Congress, which means they might actually be able to pass legislation. Um, a lot of talk about stuff that goes right in your wheelhouse, the Dodd-Frank financial reform bill from uh, the Obama years, uh, tax reform. What are you enthusiastic about? What do you hear they might work on you think will be good for the bank? Yeah, well, I think uh, in general, the, the, the thing that could benefit us in the economy is really a pro-growth reforms, tax reform uh, really being at the top of the list, uh, regulatory reform, so keep the good part of regulation and pare back the excess that's built up over time. Uh, an infrastructure spending bill would be, mm -hmm. I think, also quite positive. Eventually, you know, we're, we're, we, there's a lo long list. There's ACA reform, there's pro-energy policy, there's lower individual taxes, but I think if they focus on a few of those first big things, uh, that can kick up the growth rate in the economy, which has been probably in a 1.8 to 2% mm -hmm. GDP growth. If that next year we can get it up by, you know, maybe half a percent, so we're 2.3, 2.5. You think that's then, achievable? Yeah, I, think it's, I think it's achievable, but a lot has to play out. I think mm. the markets are anticipating that it's all going to happen <laughs> they got because very excited. they see a Republican president and Republican <laughs> administration. This is a little bit yeah. different than a traditional relationship yeah. between the administration and the Congress. So we'll see how it plays out. But I think the market is optimistic at this point. Uh, do you think when you look at uh, Dodd Frank and the financial reforms, a huge number of new regulations on banks? But you know, we have to admit things didn't go so great. Oh eight oh nine. So people might think some of that's necessary. Yeah. Would you, if they, if uh, Paul Ryan goes to you and says you're right in it, uh, Bruce, what is it? Would you go all the way back to pre Dodd no, Frank? No, I don't. I don't think so. So I, I do think uh, things like uh, annual stress testing, that whole exercise around CCAR, has really been good for risk management uh, in banks and huh. for making sure the system is safe and sound. So. Uh, we would certainly uh, keep uh, that, and uh, and there's other aspects that I think are positive for overall safety and soundness of the financial system. There's just uh, overkill and some things about how you document things that are overkill. Uh, so you have checkers checking checkers uh, that just adds up to, to cost that kind of takes some of the, the cost beyond the benefits. And you don't uh, think those at that point are really increasing the soundness no, of the I banking think, system. I think so that's, that's the art of it, is to yeah. go in and try to figure out how do we wring out a little bit of the excess and keep the good stuff. Uh, and uh, and so the system does sit, stay safer and sounder than it was before. I'm also hearing stuff that I, I wouldn't expect my banker friends to necessarily love, some stuff about uh, ha you know uh, reducing trade, uh, some, some policies in immigration that are not usually what you're hearing out of the research departments of major financial firms. Are you nervous about any of that? That yeah, piece is of the, 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 the agenda? That, that remains to be seen. So, uh, you know, I think we, 
there's, there's, there's uh, I think, a position that's fair that uh, our immigration policy has been lax and we haven't enforced it, and so what are we going to do about it? Uh, and some of these trade agreements uh, don't always work out to our benefit and can be tightened. Uh, I think the question is the degree and, and not becoming uh, protectionist, uh, but still welcoming free trade and partnership. I think the UK right now, just uh, Theresa May just came over and said, "Look, I want a deal." Uh, and, uh, Boy, did and, she want a deal! And, and, and we should be committed to open trade and leaders of the kind of Western free world the way we've always been. And I think we should embrace that. So, so a lot remains to play out there as to you know, there's some there's some campaign rhetoric, and then there's reality. And hopefully, the the overall thrust is uh, is still uh, we need trade. It's uh, it's important to overall global health and well-being uh, and we have to protect our borders but we don't want to uh, also where we need uh, skilled labor and we have a lot of folks coming over here to get educated here mm -hmm. we want some of those people to stay and uh, build careers here and it's it's to the betterment of the country some of your peer CEOs uh, turning back to Rhode Island uh, Larry Merlot at CVS Goldner at Hasbro Schweitzer at IGT they recently formed a version of the mass competitive partnership the client the partnership for Rhode Island have, have you had any conversations have they reached out to you about playing I'm, a role I'm with them you are so are you gonna take part <laughs> yes <laughs> yes so I'm, I'm going to be part of that group and we're kicking it off shortly. What do you what what should people look for for that? Can you say anything about it? Well, yet? I think uh, we're working with the governor's office just to say how can we make Rhode Island a better business climate? Uh, we can look at some of the things that Massachusetts has done, some of the improvements in infrastructure that have been good, uh, some of the education reform, uh, the tax and regulatory regime. So, I think it's just uh, you know taking a hard look and look in the mirror and say there's a lot of great things about Rhode Island, but there's some things that hold us back from being all we can be uh, and so how can we help how can if the governor has ideas how can we put our clout behind certain things or can we come up with ideas that we can get the government and the legislator to move on so uh, only about a minute left and this is a, a different kind of question but I'm curious to ask you more than three years you've now been CEO of a fortune 500 right. company a lot of not a lot of people get to that level let's say someone else got that kind of job and they came to you and said Bruce how do you do this what's the biggest best piece of advice you'd give to someone about how to run a large and publicly traded enterprise yeah well I think it starts with uh, assessing kind of the, 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 the pluses and minuses of the company and uh, building on the strengths and addressing where <laughs> there's weaknesses and then uh, coming up with that plan and then laying out the vision and getting your people to buy into the vision because uh, people are quite astute uh, and they and they and they want to have good leadership and they want uh, to, to to invest their time and effort and passion in something that makes sense to them and I think that's what we did at Citizens we basically uh, said look this is a great potential franchise it's run down a little bit under foreign ownership uh, so we weren't playing enough offense we were still playing defense as RBS was trying to right the ship uh, so how do we move forward here what are the things that we can excel out to build a top performing bank we laid that out uh, people have bought into that and when you have the full force of 18,000 people behind that vision uh, you're going to succeed. You're going to have a much better chance at success. All right. A very cheerful Bruce Van Zandt feeling good about Citizens Financial Group. Bruce, thank you for being here. And thank okay. you for joining us this week. And we'll see you back here next week on Executive Suite.